Welcome to today's IST lecture. We have a very special speaker today, Michael Jordan, from the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, he works right at the interface between computer science and statistics, is one of the world's foremost experts in statistical learning and inference, and also one of the most influential and most cited computer scientists. Just very briefly about his career, he got a PhD at UCSD in uh, 1985, working in the uh, PDB group, which uh, at that time uh, was one of the pioneers working on neural networks, and I think this is an excellent example of illustrating the timelines that are involved in basic science. If you think about 1985 neural networks, it took literally, you know, uh, 20 to 30 years for the field to become hot, but there is hardly anything harder today than neural networks and deep learning. Uh, and uh, after, after his PhD, he, he went through the ranks at MIT before moving uh, to Berkeley in 1998. We overlapped there actually a bit as colleagues. Uh, he was in the Department of uh, Computer Science, but also chair of the Department of Statistics. Uh, Michael is a member of the National Academies of the uh, Academy of Science and of Engineering. Won the AAAI Newell Award, uh, the David R uh, Ramohat Prize, and I'll cut off and not go to the long list of other awards. I'll, I'll give the time to, David, uh, to Michael here. And, uh, welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom. I'm Delighted to be here, it's a pleasure. Um, there we go. Uh, it's a very spirited crowd here, although very well behaved. They got very quiet as soon as you stood up in front of there. That's, that's unusual. And they're also very young here. I didn't realize your PhD students were this young. Um, <laughs> right, so um, yes, I've been working in this overall field for about 30, 35 years. Um, people ask me what the field is, and I don't really have a good answer. Uh, it's, I think of it as statistical inference and decision-making under uncertainty. Um, that's kind of a 300-year-old field, really. It's not new. Um, but nowadays, people call it machine learning. Sometimes it's even more, they are now calling it AI. And uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, I will be a bit of a downer here today, perhaps in the Germanic style, that I'm going to try to tell you that there's way too much hype and uh, there's excitement, that's good, but there's too much excitement. Um, we have a lot of hard engineering and scientific challenges to solve if we're going to think about intelligent systems, and I don't think we really have intelligent systems yet. So for the young people in the audience, it's something to aspire to, just like when I was young. Uh, it's not something we seem to have or possess, despite what you read in the newspapers. Um, so there, in fact, isn't that much new. Uh, let me emphasize, though, a couple of things which I think are new. Um, there are, and I have a mouse there I'd like to get rid of, see so I do that. There are large data sets, and that's really, really important, um, but there have been large data sets for a long time. If you're in the sciences, uh, you know, astronomy, genomics, and so on, we're producing large data sets, you know, 20 years ago. But what I think is interesting and different, uh, which brings it also into technology, is the data sets are very um, fine-grained, so they have data about individuals. Uh, it used to be that you collected data in science so that you could find general laws. So you could try to aspire to discover F equals MA or um, something involving pressure and volume or something, general laws from the data. You'd fit curves to try to find those laws. Uh, that still goes on, but it's much less um, the, the focus. The focus is on individualized laws or contextual laws or personalized laws. Uh, so uh, you will uh, gather data about individuals. So, that can be a person, and social networks now allow social scientists to gather data about, you know, almost every person in some population. Um, but, you know, the re a region of a sky can be a, uh, an individual, and so astronomers might be interested in something specific about a certain region of the sky. Um, and, of course, the genome. We, we now have data about every single gene. That didn't used to be the case when I was younger, uh, but that means you can now try to infer something about every single gene, say something statistical and, and interesting about every gene and so on, habitats and ecology and so on. So it's less about big, broad laws and it's more about contextual ones. Um, but now all kinds of new problems arise, uh, and in particular, um, uh, long tails. I might have a large amount of data about a few individuals and very little data about most individuals. 
So how do I give good service or do the right thing for all individuals, even though I have these long tails? And so on and so forth. So my talk will, will allude to some of these issues. They're not entirely new, but they're just now particularly in force. All right, so uh, what's challenging in this world with very large data sets where we're trying to make inferences at the level of individuals? Well, making timely, trustable, transparent inference and decision-making to the level of individuals is really, really challenging and hard. So it's a bunch of words there, and some of them are more uh, computing-oriented. Timely is a very computing word. Trustable. Um, transparent may be a more of a social science word. Inference and decision-making, that's more of a statistics word. So you start putting these blends of words together, and they all sound good, but actually we don't have any idea how to do these things. Okay? Our fields do not allow us to, to write that down as a specification and actually execute something which, which does that as promised. So that's what I'm really going to focus on, that we don't have a real engineering field yet here for bringing data and computing together, and we need to. So one way I like to say, as you saw in my title, uh, what's required, it's not just a library of all the good algorithms we have out there, uh, including the neural nets or whatever else, but it's really thinking styles. And so it's, it's not about the computer so much, it's about the humans, about how we think about building systems that now don't just do what old-fashioned systems do, um, which is deductively reason or, uh, um, or make simple predictions, but blend these things thoroughly. So let me get to that in a somewhat provocative way by imagining a conversation um, between, say, one of my grad students who's just now gone off to Silicon Valley to, uh, to work. And so, um, uh, so some of this is imagined, but some of this is, uh, is, is really real experience. Uh, so uh, the boss might say, I need a big data system, whatever that means, or an AI system nowadays, that will replace our classic service with a personalized service. All right, so this is real in Silicon Valley. For the last 10 years, I can't tell you how many companies and startups, that's their business plan. So they're gonna take, say, search, which used to be just one thing. You type in a word, and whoever types it in gets the same the same answer, same uh, set of pages. And they say, well, we could do better if we do something different for everybody, we get better service. Or commerce, or medicine. Personalized medicine is a very, very big important word. We don't wanna give the same drugs to everybody just because they present a certain set of symptoms. We don't look at their genome. We don't understand things about them and then treat them individualized. So we get into all these issues I alluded to earlier. We, you know, it might be easy to service a few people for whom we have lots of data, but we wanna give the right treatments to everybody. How do we make sure that we do that? Um, okay, so the student might say, well, okay, what is your personalized service? So let's do search just for concreteness, even though it doesn't make my point all that well. Uh, so search, what is you know, Google search or Baidu search or whatever your preferred engine is? Well, it's an algorithm of some kind, and it's statistical. It took in data, and it has parameters that were adjusted over many years to give better and better uh, responses to queries. All right? um, and so my student will say, well, teach me your algorithm, it, you know, whatever statistical procedures that were being used, let me learn about them. And now I'm not going to implement just one of them that takes all of your data in and gives out a search engine. I'm going to implement 100,000 of the same copy of the algorithm using different data sets for each individual. And maybe I'll clump together individuals a bit so that I don't, you know, have small data problems. Um, so that'll take me a couple of years probably. You'll have to pay me, you know, a lot, give me a lot of computers, but, you know, I can probably try to do this. All right, but then the boss starts adding more requirements. Boss says, Oh, by the way, it should work reasonably well for anyone and everyone. I can't, I can tolerate a few errors, but not too many dumb ones that'll embarrass us. And again, this is kind of an obvious requirement, uh, no big deal, but think about it intellectually. What does it mean? All right. Well, um, these systems are always statistical. They're taking in data and changing some parameters in a system. And so statistical systems always have some kind of an error rate. Uh, you know, we typically control it at 0.01 or 0.05 or 0.01 or something. And what that means is that we compute various means and standard deviations and so on, and we make sure that things are in some specified range. Um, now, if I have a system that's serving 10,000 people, like in the beginning of a startup, and I have, you know, 0.01 is my error rate, that means that 10 people are getting bad service. And that's fine. Everyone understands that a system's not perfect, and, you know, occasionally you'll get bad service. But now what happens in Silicon Valley is that from one day to the next, you go from 10,000 users to 10 million users because your service caught on. People noticed it and liked it and started using it. All right? But if you have the same algorithm implemented in there, your 1% error rate goes to 10,000 people being served badly. All right? And that's no good because they're all going to write to the newspaper and everyone's going to notice that huge numbers of people are not getting served well and your system will look stupid and no one will use it. Okay? So this happens. This has happened and it will continue to happen. Um, so how do you deal with that, 
right? Well, this is serious because uh, we, we have these statistical systems that have our error rate. So this means you have to worry about things like what we call the L-infinity norm and not the L1 or 2 norm. You have to worry about more stringent criteria on things, robustness issues. So you do that with more engineering and more math. You have to worry about the tails of distributions. You have to worry about their shapes, not necessarily Gaussian and so on. The same kind of things that people in the financial crisis sort of worried about, but not enough. Um, you know, people were making too many bets because they were modeling the wrong distributions in part. Um, so this is a hard thing to do, and my student will say, well, okay, I know kind of how to think about these things, but it, I'm going to have to really do serious engineering to get to all these distributions, not just the means and variances and so on. So it'll take me more time, and I, can't, I can make fewer guarantees, but I'll try. All right, now the next thing the boss says is also very straightforward, but is really intellectually interesting. The boss says it should run just as fast as our classic service. So this, again, is just life in Silicon Valley. You can't have systems that run slower and slower as you add features. Just can't do it. So if you're around in the 1990s, like I was, uh, you'll remember that Google Search came out. And one of the features of it was that you'd hit the return button, you'd type in a query, hit a return button, and it would give you an answer in two seconds, reliably, every time. All right? And that's kind of the cycle at which you think. It used to be before that you hit a return and you'd wait 10 seconds, maybe, or three, or 17. And that's too slow. You'd get impatient and it was annoying. Um, so they did this with a huge amount of engineering. They had many servers and uh, you know, load balancing and so on and so forth. They really worked hard and they got it down to two seconds. Right now, you're proposing to roll out a new service which is personalized. Well, what does that mean? It means there's not just one model you're serving up to everybody quickly in some sharded way. You're serving up 100,000 models. You have to find the right model at the right time and get it to the right place and all that. So yet more engineering, a lot more engineering, all right? Um, and so, so this, again, the student says, well, this brings kind of together computer science with statistics. It says, I want a runtime constraint, which is, you know, maybe two seconds, and I want to ensure that a system that's statistical, it has an error rate, you control a certain error at a certain runtime, okay? And we don't have a science that has runtime and statistical risk together in the same equation. We don't have that. And so, again, the student will sort of say, I can try, and I bet you I'll, I'll build something, it probably might slow down because it's doing a whole lot more work. And in that case, you just have to buy more servers and hope that it'll start to work. All right, now this next point is the one that to me is really makes it clear this is an intellectual problem and not just a systems building problem. Um, so it should only improve as we collect more data. In particular, it shouldn't slow down. So today I have a terabyte of data and in 10 years I'll have petabytes of data and the boss thinks, surely the service should only get better because we have better data about every individual and so we should be able to personalize better. The service should only get better. How can it get worse? All right, but what the boss is now asking is for a constant time algorithm. As data grows, the algorithm should never slow down. It's, it's constant time in the amount of data you have. And I don't know any algorithms that are constant time in the amount of data and still have the same error. Okay, just don't exist. All right, so at this point, you have to hack around a bit. You have to throw away some of your data and see if it's fast enough, but the error didn't go up too much or you add more servers and paralyze, but we don't really know if that'll help the error rate, which is unquantifiable. Um, so at this point, my student may or may not run out of the room. He or she might say, I just can't do this. I can't guarantee anything. I'll just try, but you know, um, because we don't have a science that, that permits us to do this. Okay, so um, uh, I think we're sort of like we were 3,000 years ago with, with uh, building buildings and bridges. So 3,000 years ago, humans learned to build tall buildings and bridges, and that was great. Economies went forward and great things happened. But a lot of them fell down and a lot of people died over the 3,000 years. A lot of bad things happened. And eventually a field emerged called civil engineering, which was able to say, you want a building of a certain size, of this kind of soil, this kind of wind, and so on, here's how you do it. Here's some rules of thumb and, and some rules. All right? And I think we have nothing like that in computer science and statistics. We have nothing like that kind of engineering discipline. Um, now, in the real world, of course, you try these things, and again, it's like building a building. Sometimes you manage to do it, and great, you make money, and sometimes you don't. I would say trying to do things like this on this slide, there's probably you know, 10,000 companies in Silicon Valley that have tried, and very, very few have succeeded. They mostly fail. Now, Google or something is such a big company, they could just throw so much money at it, they can occasionally succeed at things like this. But it's somehow not where we should be. Now, if you think about search, you don't really care because a bad search engine will just deliver some bad results. And you'll maybe scroll to the second or third page and that may be okay. Um, but what about a bad medical system that's doing personalized medicine? That's not making timely decisions, it waits for days instead of hours and someone could die. What about a bad finance system or transportation system 
that's making 100,000 decisions over a city and it sends everybody to the same stoplight uh, because it just it didn't you know, plan for all the errors that could happen. Uh, and so on. So we're trying to build infrastructures that are based on AI these days, and we're using algorithms that have really no control over time and error rates and so on. So we have a bit of headache ahead, all right? Also, I already think you see this in journalism. You see large numbers of false positives, large numbers of results which don't turn out to be true. Uh, you see this in especially the social sciences, large numbers of results which are not replicating, and it's a symptom of the same sort of thing. We don't have control over the quantity we care about, which is the overall error rate on a bunch of decisions. And again, in some domains, that's okay, just bad science gets done. But if you make 100,000 bad transportation or finance decisions, you can make a city run to, grind to a halt or make a, an economy grind, uh, have severe problems. All right, now there are more problems in the real world. For example, the data are owned by people and their privacy concerns and they vary across clients. So you have to worry about all that too if you're really building the right system. Um, okay, so I hope you see that's kind of a fanciful discussion, but it's, it's real on every point and it shows us that we don't have solutions to these things. All right, so I think the way to, to start thinking about this is, first of all, to recognize we have some traditions that help us but don't solve the problem. So I call one of them computational thinking. This is not my word. It's a sort of standard in National Science Foundation buzzword. Um, but it really means the kind of things you learn in a good computer science class. Abstraction, modularity, scalability, robustness, and how to be an engineer with concepts like that. Not just how to learn a language and write in Python or Skylab, but that. Um, now, inferential thinking is perhaps a little less familiar to you, and I certainly mean statistics here, but I mean a broader collection of disciplines, including information theories, you know, physics, that think about this problem, which is not just look at the data, but think about the real-world phenomena that gave rise to the data and the sampling pattern that occurred, and then solve inverse problems that go backwards from data to the thing in the world. So I'm going to try to make this more concrete in a moment here, but this is what you learn in a, in a good statistical class, not just formulas for plugging in data, but how to think about inferential problems, right? And these two thinking styles are kind of rare in the same individual. Um, they're kind of deductive and inductive, but this is what industry wants when they're trying to hire a data scientist. They want someone who can do both this, do an A-B test, which is trying to say whether some conditions differ from another, but do it in a computationally scalable way, for example. That happens all the time. Um, so let me say this one more time uh, for such to the theoretical computer science community in, in the audience, um, which is if you look at the core theories in CS and statistics, uh, they don't really cohere. There's an oil and water problem. So core statistical theory is basically statistical decision theory, comes out of game theory. Um, it has a lot of equations in it, and they are trade-off relationships among the amount of data you have, the risk, the parameter dimension, the hypothesis complexity, You'll get equations like d log d over square root of n as the, as the risk. Um, and these are really used in real life by people all the time. Uh, and they come out of some mathematics involving statistical decision theory. In those equations of which there are you know, probably at least 100,000 papers written on these things in different problem settings, uh, you'll never see the word runtime. It's not a formal concept in that theory. So you can't trade off runtime with amount of data and risk and complexity and so on. Uh, now, in computer science, there's a, there's a complexity theory. You know, there's many complexity theories you know, coming out of Turing and other. Um, and you'll see trade-offs among runtime and memory and space and all that, all kinds of equations, again, you know, n log n and so on. Uh, but you won't see the statistical risk, which is an expectation. You won't see that. You see lots of supremums, but very few expectations, or really none. Um, and this really comes out if you start looking at lower bounds. Uh, lower bounds are where you start to know that you fundamentally understood a problem. It, it's where you know the best you can do and whether you can achieve that. And there are lots of lower bounds in statistics, and we often have, it's an older field, it's 300 years old. There are lots of lower bounds and there's lots of matching uh, procedures that achieve those bounds. Uh, in computer science, there are fewer lower bounds, and mostly they do not, are not matched by the upper bound, by, by known algorithm. Uh, it's partly because computer science is newer, and partly because it's in some ways a, you know, a more complicated notion to compute. And Turing gave us kind of a notion of computing anything. So we need to compute something a little bit more narrow than that. Um, so anyway, these challenges are daunting. So let me talk a little bit about what uh, I've been doing in my group. I'm gonna talk about privacy, partly because it's a topic of general public interest, and I know this is a more public lecture here. But I want to set up a little bit of the mathematical challenges of trying to guarantee people's privacy while you analyze their data, okay? Um, so I'll spend a little time on that to sort of make a couple points. I think I'm going to skip communication for a want of time, 
And this last one is uh, the last, the second half of my talk. It will be more technical, and it, there's a lot of buzzwords there you may not know much about. Um, but I, 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 it's really just basic uh, physics style science. And I know there's a lot sort of physics and math people, uh, and I think you'll appreciate how this relates to computation. So it's gonna be kind of how to, it's continuous time thinking out of physics relate to computation in what I think is a new way. All right, so let's get going. This is uh, work with John Ducci and Martin Wainwright at Berkeley, uh, starting to think about inference and privacy. Um, okay, so you all read about privacy in the newspaper and so on all, all the time about we, you know, our data is being used by corporations. Uh, you know, is that good or bad? And how could, that, how could we get some guarantees that it's not gonna be misused? Um, so there are fields, technical fields, that try to get at this to some degree. Uh, one such technical field is called differential privacy, um, where uh, you uh, add noise to data such that you can guarantee that certain things can't be said about an individual from the noised up data. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit here in a moment. And you want to trade off the uh, loss of privacy as quantified by differential privacy against the value we obtain from data analysis. All right, so this is very, very important in medical domains in particular. Um, so when I go to the doctor, he or she gathers lots of data about me, and if that data were aggregated with everybody's data, medical science would go forward pretty quickly. Uh, it's not. Hospital barriers, uh, all kinds of administrative barriers block that. In particular for cancer, uh, if you could gather all the cancerous genomes around the world right now, sequence every one of them, and learn about the whole phylogenetic tree of the way that cells can go bad, uh, there aren't billions of them, there are probably hundreds. And you could figure out all the possible cancerous paths and you could find drugs to treat those by cloning the cells and so on. This could be done in our lifetime. And one of the main things blocking it is the damned legal and administrative barriers for sharing data, okay? Um, so uh, the, the problem right now is either you share it completely and you don't worry about anybody's privacy, that happens a lot on the internet, or you block it completely, the lawyers tell you you can't do it and you're done. So we have to get something in the middle. All right, so we want to be able to do good inference by um, uh, putting uh, private data analysis together with, with statistics. All right, so let's uh, start to talk a little bit more about this computational thinking and inferential thinking, how they're different and how they're the same. Uh, so let's think about, uh, about uh, privacy from the point of view of a database person. So a database person starts with a database which has data in it. So let's think about a classical example like banking data. So I have a banking data set where I have people, I have their age, their height, their weight, where they live, and how much money they have in the bank, what, whatever, something like that. And I have that for a lot of people. Um, and so uh, in databases, you learn how to put a query into such a database and get out an answer, which I'm gonna call theta twiddle in somewhat odd notation. Um, and you might, the query might be something like, who has the most money in my bank, or what's the median, or whatever, okay? Now, we probably want to protect the privacy of the people in this, in this data set. So there is a theory that's emerged, uh, several theories, but one of them is called differential privacy, where you have a, uh, a channel a, which adds noise to the original database and gives you a privatized database. Uh, so um, it makes certain guarantees. So for example, if, if Tom were in the original database, after I add the noise, I cannot say uh, that whether Tom was in or not in the original data. Okay, so he has plausible deniability. If that were a database of criminals, he would want to have that deniability. Okay, um, so there's a specific kind of noise which is added which allows this to happen. And now you can do some mathematics. You can say, uh, if the same query comes into the privatized days, I'll get an answer which is of course different, but I can prove that theta hat will be close to theta twiddle over some family of queries over all databases. So that sort of theory exists, and it's a kind of beautiful example of computational thinking. All right, now, so, um, when I learned about this, I would ask some of my colleagues who work on this, uh, you know, well, is the, that's great. Uh, there's a little bit of probability in there. But, uh, so is this actually inferential? And they'd say, you mean like statistics? I said, yeah. And, and they'd say, well, of course, because the query can be anything. The query could be compute the mean or the standard deviation or do a regression. Isn't that statistics? Um, and I said, no, you don't get it. That's, that's, that's descriptive statistics. You're just describing the data. That's not inferential. And they'd say, well, what are you talking about? And so then I realized that I had an issue. Uh, so um, yes, uh, if the query could be anything, in some sense, computational thinking is everything, but that's not the right way to think because there's a whole different thinking style associated with inference. So let's draw a different picture. So a query comes into a database, now it comes an answer. I've just moved it over to the right. All right, now let's think about a different kind of database, not banking data. Let's think about medical data. 
where uh, I have a bunch of people and I have their age, their height, and their weight, and um, I have how long they lived after I gave them a treatment versus a control, typical medical data, okay? Now, do I want to protect the privacy of the people in that database? Obviously, same thing, right? But am I interested only in the people in the database? Probably in the, medic in the banking example, yeah. Uh, if, if you're in my bank, I care about you, but if you're not in my bank, I don't care, okay? I'm only interested in people in the bank. Whereas in the medical example, I'm probably interested mostly in people who aren't in my data but could have been in my data. That's a call to population. So, in fact, the people in the medical database from whom I got the data could be dead and gone, but the study I did to study the drug is still valid, and I'm going to use it for future people that come into my office, people who could have been in the data but weren't. And when you say language like that, it's subjunctive tense, could have been in the data but weren't, that's inference. So um, the way you make mathematics out of that is you say, well, behind the data, there must have been a population for which the data rose, and it's not population of all people, it's some subset of some way, and I have to specify that. And I have to specify the sampling pattern that gave rise to the data, which might not be uniform sampling. I better be worried about that, all right? And now I conceptually put a query into that population, and that will come an answer, and then to do mathematics, I need to prove that theta is close to theta twiddle over, say, all queries and with high probability over the sampling pattern S and maybe overall P. And there are hundreds of thousands of papers in the statistical literature which do exactly that, okay? Showing efficiency and consistency, which means that theta is close to theta twiddle. All right, so um, this previous slide, there's probably not 100,000 papers, it's a newer field, but maybe 10,000 papers that do that, and there's 100,000 to do this. But I hope you see where I'm going. The real problem is to put the two together. And there are probably five papers that try to do this. Um, so the real problem is that I collect the data, say medical data, from, uh, and I have a database, but I have to think about where the, pop, where the data came from and how it arose, and I then have to privatize because I want to protect people's privacy. And now I've got to prove that theta is close to theta hat with high probability over S and Q and over all queries and over all populations. Uh, and I don't even care about theta twiddle at all. All right. So that to me is the real problem, and it's just not studied at all. Why? Because one of the problems is very natural for computer scientists to start with the data and process it, and the other is very natural for statisticians to start with the data and go backwards to try to figure out how the data rose. All right, but the real problem is the two together. All right, so we could do this in other fields too where these barriers have kind of hindered us. All right, now how do we do mathematics on that thing right there? So I'm gonna make a proposal. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the privacy setting. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to get into details here. This is just to uh, hopefully you'll follow, uh, this, this will help you follow what I'm saying without the details being important. Uh, this is kind of a standard picture for privacy. I have data X1 through Xn, might be in different people. This might be their blood pressure. They don't want to reveal that, but after you put it through a noisy channel and add some noise, they're willing to show that data to a central statistician who computes an estimator theta hat, all right? And now there exists this uh, design uh, field called differential privacy. It tells you how to design Q, all right? And so Q has a parameter, which I uh, will be calling alpha, which is standard in differential privacy. When alpha is set to zero, I completely add uh, so much noise to the data, you can't even see the original data anymore. So I'm to you're totally private, guaranteed. And when alpha gets larger, up to one, two, up to infinity, um, you uh, have less and less privacy, the data is being touched less and less, and this is quantifiable, okay? Um, so um, now we're gonna do one piece of math, um, and uh, there's a lot of symbols here, which you're not gonna need to really understand, but I just want to tell you that uh, everything from the blue on is very classical, it's called minimax theory in statistics. So this is just a, uh, so let me just go through the little pieces here. Um, what we're trying to do is take an estimator based on private data. And we're trying to compare that to some truth. This is a so-called loss function, which says how unhappy are you if the truth is something and you estimated something else? All right, so this is a random quantity. So statisticians, the first thing they do is take an expectation over all the randoms in the problem, including critically the population from which the data arose. All right, this is now the algorithmic randomness, which computational people are used to adding. This is more the statistical randomness, but we take a total expectation. This is called now a risk function. So everybody talks about risk like in economics and so on. This is just a standard risk function. Now we take a worst case risk, and here's where a certain branch of statistics becomes more like computer science. We take a worst case, but it's a worst case over an expectation. That, that's critically different. It makes the, the math different in computer science and in statistics. And then finally, we take a infima. We take the best estimator 
that uh, achieves the worst risk. So this is called mini-max risk. All right? That's been studied for about 100 years. Uh, the progenitor was Wald, who was an econometrician and a statistician. Um, and what does it mean to be a study, this equation? Well, you do this for different kinds of problems, different choices of p and theta hat and so on, and you get, uh, the mathematics tells you things like that this object goes to zero at a certain rate. For example, d log d over square root of n would be a standard rate. As n gets larger, the, ri the risk goes down, and it depends on the dimensionality in a certain way. And the mathematics is kind of applied math, counting numbers, complexities, uh, information theoretic ideas, and so on, all come to bear on, on these kind of computations. So what we've done here is just add one piece here. Um, so we said we want to bring this statistical framework together with this computational idea. What we're going to do is take a further infimum optimized over all channels which respect differential privacy to level alpha. All right, and that's a well-formed set there. It's, it's not convex, but it's, it's well-formed, and we can do some mathematics with it, okay? So otherwise, I'm gonna guarantee you differential private level alpha. Uh, that doesn't pin down the challenge, many channels which will do that, many different ways of adding noise, but I'm gonna pick the best one from the point of view of statistical inference. All right, so that's a well-formed mathematical problem which we can now work on, and we did. We did this for a whole bunch of different statistical models, and we got out some answers, and, um, I think I'll just briefly, uh, let me skip that. Let me, let me show you some answers. In a particular problem, um, here's, a, here's a classical rate that you would get out. Here's the risk, and here is the rate it goes down to zero. It goes as one over the square root of the amount of data you have, okay? Um, that's gotten by solving that minimax from the blue on. So now let's solve the bigger problem, which includes the further infimum, and we should get alpha appearing in this equation somehow. Right, because they're taking an infimum over all channels at level alpha, so alpha must appear in the solution. And the question is how? Does it appear in a strange way? Does it appear in a different way in every problem? And the answer, it turns out, it's very, very simple, and it appears the same way in most every problem. So we think of this as kind of a law of private data analysis. What happens is that n gets multiplied by alpha squared. All right, so let me try to make this concrete. So suppose I go to Tom, and I say, Tom, I want your genome to study for some purpose, all right? Um, and he's gonna say, well, what, why, what problem? And what he's saying in my language is, what's your loss function, all right? So we have to have a dialogue. And I'll say, well, my loss function, what I'm doing is I'm studying a disease that runs in your family. And he might say, well, great, that's really important, just here's my data, um, you know, just here it is, uh, setting alpha to infinity. Or I might say, I'm using it to set insurance rates in, in Austria. And he might say, well, that's a socially important problem, uh, I want you to have my data, but protect me. I don't want to just have it out there. You know, you can't use all my data. Like maybe take every tenth nucleotide or something of my DNA. Um, uh, and, um, or I might say, no, I'm using it to, to decide what ads to place on your browser. And he'll say, no, I don't like that. Uh, set alpha to zero. So he has a knob that he can turn, which depends on his own feelings about his own data and the problem that the statistician is trying to solve. It's not just difference of privacy. It's what's your problem. So maybe he then thinks about that for a little while, and he says, for me, for that problem, my alpha equals 0.5. Uh, is, I'm comfortable with that. Now, over time, this will be just like euros or you know, uh, dollars. You'll get used to what it means for alpha equals 0.5. Maybe right now you don't have a feeling about that. I kind of do. But you'll get that, too. Everyone will get used to a notion of privacy. It's not 0, 1. It's something in the middle. All right? So he says 0.5. All right, so I say, okay, fine, and now before I've collected any data, I go and I take 0.5 and I square it, I get 0.25, I multiply that by n, and that means to achieve the same risk as before, uh, in the private setting, all I gotta do is collect four times as much data from people like Tom, and I can get the same risk. So that's a bit of engineering, if you will, a rule of thumb, all right? I know I can make a contract about privacy, I know how much data to gather to achieve a certain risk. That's what you need to solve the real world problem. And I don't have to have everybody have the same alpha, you can have individualized alpha. So I can gather data from all of you, I can sign an individualized contract that'll guarantee your privacy, I can then collect all the data, I can analyze it, and I will guarantee a certain level of risk, i.e. I will solve the problem I told my boss I was trying to solve. All right, um, so uh, there it is, there's, a, there's this little law, and it turns out that in a wide variety of statistical inference problems, that always happens, and there's information theoretic reasons why it, why it does, and I could explain that to you. Um, Okay, so that was kind of the, the, you know, let me go back to this picture of the math here. Uh, so what we did is we simply took a statistical criterion and we turned it into a constrained optimization problem where the constraint comes from some other field, in this particular case, privacy. 
Now you can do things like this with other infimums out front. You can say, what if my data is all so big that I can't transmit it all to back to the central site? It's just too big. It's, it's petabytes of data like many companies have. So I have to compress it to get it back to the central site in a, in rapidly. All right? How do you compress data? Uh, well, again, um, there's old fields that tell you about this, and Shannon told us how to compress data, but only when you're trying to have the total bit length be small. All right? That has nothing to do with statistical inference. So a classical compression uh, uh, idea could take the data, compress it, and totally ruin it for, for inference. It could compress just the wrong things for the actual inferential problem. So, um, so you want to do something like this. Over all channels that have a certain bit rate, have the minimum of the risk. That would compress in a way that preserves the data for statistical inference. All right, so we've worked on that as well and have some papers about that. And I'm gonna skip that part of the talk um, for want of time, I wanna do this last bit. Um, but it's interesting, it's an alternative to Shannon theory and it has its own justification, it has its own um, uh, uh, you know, sorts of techniques that allow you to design codes that do these sorts of things. Um, and now you can think about other externalities, that's you know, privacy, compression, you know, other you know, maybe social goods that you'd like to optimize for in the face of doing inference, okay? Um, all right, but let's now turn to, I'm gonna in fact also skip this little bit here about, um, now let me say something about this. So, um, uh, Tom, you're gonna tell me if I'm starting to run out of time. Let me go back to this little example here. So this makes it more concrete. So why would you ever do it? What is this theory relevant to? So let's suppose that you're uh, looking at hospitals in Vienna and you know, here's an individual that arrives at a hospital and you find, you'd like to know what substances they abuse. So let's suppose this person abuses alcohol and cocaine and not anything else. You'd like to gather a lot of data like that from you know, thousands of people and find out what the underlying proportions in the population are, in some population. So maybe it's like 0.45 of all people in some city abuse alcohol and so on. So these are pretty high numbers, but whatever. Now, uh, why would you want numbers like that? Uh, well, you'd want numbers like that because you now would know how many hospitals to build and how many doctors per hospital and you, do, could, you could do public policy. Well, how do you get numbers like that? Well, that's statistics. You have to estimate them from data. So if you had data like this, there's a classical estimator called maximum likelihood, which takes sample proportions, which are uniformly good approximations to that. They go down at rate one over square root of n. Um, all right, but no one wants to provide data like that. All right, so instead they want to guarantee that that data goes through some messed up channel which that they wouldn't be embarrassed by revealing, uh, and, that, and that's the whole point of differential privacy. Okay, so how do people really do that in differential privacy literature? Well, they just do it by adding privacy, adding noise, but not worrying about the inferential problem. So here's a typical way it's done. You add, so here's a, a vector of day, real data, one, zero, one, zero, zero. You add noise to that, and the noise is heavy-tailed. It's called Laplace noise. It's called the Laplace mechanism. And you can easily prove that when you add the plus noise, you guarantee differential privacy, okay, at level alpha, all right? The problem is now, if you put that into this theory I've just told you about and ask, do you still do good inference? The answer is no, you get bad inference, all right? So now you can ask, is there another mechanism that achieves this lower bound that, we've, that, I, that I wrote down? And it turns out there is, and I'm gonna show you what it is. So um, take the original data, and now take a random bit vector, V, so let's maybe random 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. And then take one minus V, two random bit vectors. And now transmit to the statistician, not the original data, but transmit the closer of V and one minus V to the original data. So one of those will be closer to the original data, the other will be further. And transmit the closer with probability proportional to E to the alpha, where alpha is the differential privacy parameter, right here. Okay, so if alpha is zero, in which I, I claim we're guaranteeing privacy, I get one over one plus one, which is one half. And so I'm transmitting either V or one minus V with probability one half. I'm transmitting random noise to you equally probable. So I'm giving you nothing. And so in fact, I'm guaranteeing privacy. All right, if alpha gets larger, then I'm transmitting the closer of the two vectors. So I'm transmitting information to you. Now this seems like a dumb way to transfer. I'm not even giving you the original data. I'm just giving you some random noise, but I'm biasing it a little bit. All right, so you need a theory at this point to say, is that a good mechanism or a bad one? And it turns out this is optimal. It achieves that lower bound, okay? So that wouldn't have been known if you had done this bit of math. And here's the actual data. This is drug abuse warning network data. This is this L infinity error, this stringent error. This is the sample size. And the add Laplace mechanism is the green curve, bad error, and this is on a log scale, so quite bad. And the, the optimal mechanism I just mentioned is the blue curve. It's much, much better, okay? 
All right, so that's all I want to say about that. And let me now move to the second half of the talk. Um, so what you'd ideally like to do is go back to that Minimax equation now and add a further infimum, which is uh, an infimum over all computational mechanisms that have a certain time budget or a certain space budget or something like that, what a complexity theorist does. All right? The problem is I don't know how to do that or no one else knows how to do that. That set of computationally constrained mechanisms is too big. It's not mathematically characterizably easily to put into an optimization problem. Um, and it really seems kind of hopeless. All right? uh, it's not a convex set and it's, it's just complicated. So, you know, Kolmogorov complexity was one kind of attempt to do things like this, but it's just not helpful here. So I consider this open, uh, completely open, um, yeah, very, very hard. Uh, so how do you trade off computational complexity against risk? I, th I consider that open. Um, so in my own group, this is some of the kind of things we've been doing in, like over the last 10 years. Uh, this is just some various projects that, uh, one of them related runtime to convex geometry. That's already been done by the CS theorists. And then we related risk to convex geometry. And so then you could get trade-offs between runtime and risk via geometry. Uh, we also use database ideas to have parallelism trade-off against risk. Those are very pretty in some level, but they're very limited. So uh, applied to only to denoising problems and to various problems with lots of symmetry. Uh, so they were kind of a proof of concept, but they are not the solution. Um, I will talk about optimization. That's the, uh, the, the, the part of the talk I want to get to. And then you can always think about taking big data sets and subsampling them. So you get small data sets um, and try to get trade-offs. But this is mostly heuristic field at this point. This is what many people are doing. If I have a big data set, I subsample it. Um, and that's called divide and conquer in computer science. Uh, the algorithm will probably run faster because it's working on smaller amounts of data. But the statistical risk will be worse because you have smaller amounts of data. Your error bars will be bigger. All right? And to quantify that trade-off would be ideal. And that's not known how to do it. Right? So we have a couple of projects where we did that in a limited way, but it's really, really, really open. OK, so let me turn to this second half. Um, of the talk. Um, so first of all, grad students working with me, uh, uh, Andrew Wibisono and Aisha Wilson at uh, Berkeley have uh, really uh, you know, led this project. And then Mike Betancourt is a, a researcher at Columbia who's been joining us in this latter part of this. Um, okay, so uh, this is a very important point to make, which is that um, you know, data science, whatever you want it to be, uh, is you know, this somehow this field that is uh, you know, statistical and computational. Optimization is kind of the lingua franca that everyone talks, um, all right? Um, and in fact, the complexity theory in optimization is the complexity theory that's been the most useful, not the one out of computer science. Uh, so optimization certainly supplies lots of algorithms, uh, but surprisingly, perhaps to, to many of us, including me, uh, it also supplies lower bounds and thereby fundamental understanding. Um, so. Um, when I was a grad student, it was in the 80s, and uh, I learned some optimization, but I was taught that it was basically a finished field. Um, it was kind of done. There was uh, conjugate gradient algorithms, there was LFBFGS algorithms, simplex algorithms, and they all had a known runtime and a rate, and they were good, and they worked in practice, and there was lots of software for them, and it was just a toolbox, all right? Um, in the meantime, around that time, in the 80s, uh, basically the Russian school uh, by led by people like Nemirovsky and Nestrov were revolutionizing um, optimization, discovering lower bounds and discovering new algorithms that achieved the lower bound. And then there was the interior point revolution simultaneously. And so those revolutions continue to this day, and they are what feed are feeding most of this machine learning frenzy. So all the deep nets and all that are being driven by algorithms that these people were sort of focusing on and, and started to focus on in the 80s. Um, okay, so, so it is a very live, vibrant field optimization uh, as a mathematical field, but maybe surprisingly, it's really still kind of immature. And so I want to try to tell you why it's immature, one way it's immature. All right, so to do that, I'm going to be a little bit grandiose with apologies, but um, I think this is a nice way to make the point, which is that many of the most mature fields have an interplay between differentiation and integration. Uh, so it's usually called the fundamental theorem of calculus, Right, which is if I integrate a derivative, I get the original function. Um, but that comes up so many ways in so many different fields. Um, and so one of the early signs of this was in physics. Uh, you know, uh, Newton wrote down F equals MA, which is uh, expressing laws of nature in terms of derivatives. A is a derivative, it's, a, it's an acceleration. Um, 
And uh, 100 years later, Lagrange came along and said, I'm going to rewrite all of your differential equations using derivatives. I'm going to rewrite them using integrals. Okay? And so he wrote down a certain Lagrangian or action, integrated it, and found the paths that minimized that. So he both brought integrals into the picture and optimization, minimization of integrals. Um, so some of the other mature fields include probability and statistics, where Laplace expansions and Zettelplan expansions are, so are widely used. These are ways to integrate by using Hessians and other derivatives. Okay? Um, statistical physics has a lot of interplay between differentiation and integration. The numerical disciplines also, so finite element analysis, which is in fact used to build buildings and bridges, uh, is taking partial differential equations, i.e. derivatives, and turning them into little pieces of integrals and putting those together. Um, and then Monte Carlo, uh, you know, very widely used in all the disciplines, uh, is trying to integrate, and it critically uses derivatives inside the integration. The best Monte Carlo methods are using derivatives. So I could go on, but just gives you a little bit of the flavor. And in optimization, uh, you could look at as many papers as you want. You'll find tons of derivatives, and you'll not find an integral sign in sight. So I think this is actually a sign of immaturity and opt opportunity for those of us who want to work on new problems. Okay, so let's be concrete. There'll be a little bit of math here, but I think the story will come forward if you, even if you don't have a lot of math. In fact, the math, one of the beauties of optimization is the math is often pretty elementary. Just a little bit of calculus is all you really need. Um, so here's a classical problem. Take unconstrained convex optimization. So F's a convex function, so it's a bowl-shaped function, okay? And we want to go to the bottom of the bowl, all right? Um, I could easily talk about non-convex and constraints, but I'm not just for simplicity. So this is a good old-fashioned problem. There's an algorithm known, which I, you know, Newton probably would recognize, which is that you start at a certain point and then you go down the gradient of the function to get the next point. Now what's probably Newton didn't yet realize, but is kind of a newer result, which is that this algorithm has a rate, not just for a particular function, but over a family of functions. And so in fact, for over all convex functions that are smooth, this algorithm will converge at the rate one over k. It's a worst case rate. Meaning that after k steps have gone by, the error is guar you're guaranteed you a little ball around the solution of size one over k. So as k gets larger, you're closer and closer at this rate. All right. So for years, this is the kind of thing people would do. They would propose an algorithm, and they would somehow find a convergence rate. And if it was a good rate, you'd put it in software, and the field was kind of going ahead. At some point, finally, Nemirovsky and others asked the question, is that the best you can do? So that's a complexity theoretic question. All right. Now, um, if you just went to complexity theory in computer science, you wouldn't get a very helpful answer. Because if you allowed yourself a Turing machine at this point, the best you could do is just hop to the answer in one step. You'd look at the function description somehow and calculate and go to the answer. All right, so you needed a weaker oracle than that. And so Nemirovsky said, Here, let me think, of, here's an oracle for this. What we're going to do is allow ourselves a computer that can have access to the function value of f and the gradient at any moment and has to take its next step within the linear span of all previous gradients. So it's a restricted oracle model of computation. Still can compute a lot, uh, can do neural nets or whatever, but it can't do everything. Um, all right, uh, conjugate gradient, gradient descent, all fit within that framework. And he asked, in that model, uh, is there a lower bound? And he found one, and it was one over k squared, faster than gradient descent. And that was probably a surprise to people because gradient descent, if you're just looking at gradients, is locally optimal, it's steepest descent. How could there be something better than that? Right? And so now there was, there was a period in which there was an open problem. Is there something to achieve this lower bound or is it kind of a dumb lower bound? And it turned out there was something to achieve the lower bound and it's called Nesterov's accelerated gradient. And here it is. Nesterov wrote this down in 1983. So this is again in the Russian literature uh, and it kind of took the fall of the Berlin Wall for this to become more widely known but it's still not that well known outside of optimization, I should say. Anyway, it's a pair of equations and not a single equation. And one of the equations is doing a gradient descent, the other is kind of doing a little bit of an extrapolation. All right, so how did he come up with this? It's not entirely clear. He uh, is a brilliant guy who can't explain it all that well. He says something about modeling the function. Uh, but many people have intuitions about it. It looks like a little bit of like a heavy ball method or there's momentum or there's lots of intuitions. But I think to this day, it's not really clear where this is coming from, okay? But it works. It goes down faster, provably, and achieves the oracle rate. All right, so in the meantime, that was 1983. What's happened in the meantime uh, as people have been continuing to work on this? Well, there's tons of other methods, not just gradient descent. There's mirror descent. There's all these other things. And people took every one of those methods, and they accelerated them. Kind of, and what does that mean? They used Nesterov's kind of mathematics, his, his algebra, 
to take the equations and manipulate them and to get new algorithms that had maybe not two equations, but three, or not three, but four, and then prove that they had the faster rate. And there's those many practical algorithms in this list. FIST is well known as a practical algorithm, stochastic gradient, and so on, and there's all these examples. Now, very interesting things about this. First of all, it's not clear where they're all coming from. Secondly, they're not descent methods. Uh, so gradient descent is a descent method. It, it's guaranteed to go downhill in every step. Nesterov's algorithm does not do that. It sometimes goes back up. How could an algorithm be optimal in terms of getting to the bottom of the hill if it's going back up from time to time? Right? Well, just the, it, it's true. It's the optimal thing to do is to go back up sometimes. Um, so there's a lot of interesting mysteries here. Um, OK, so I'm going to tell you what I think is the, the answer, the right way to think about the problem, at least, and partially an answer. Um, and again, Tom, flag me if uh, you think I need to stop. Um, so uh, let me just tell you that the right way to think about this problem is not to stay in discrete time. So I think the only way to understand this is to go into continuous time, all right? Um, and that's a shock to people in optimization. Almost all the work in optimization, people talk about continuous versus discrete optimization, all right? That's the variables that are continuous or discrete, but it's all done in discrete time, all right? Um, and a lot of the people who went into computer science went into computer science to get away from differential equations. Um, and I'm telling you right now that that's too bad. You're going to have to learn about differential equations. So why? Well, the notion of accelerating doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're just hopping around in a discrete set of points. All right, here's the points, and if I hop faster, what does that mean? Whereas in continuous time, it's very clear what it means. It means step on the accelerator and move faster. It's a differential notion. All right, so if we're trying to understand acceleration, I, I believe we need to go into continuous time. All right, so how do you go into continuous time with gradient descent? Well, that's really well known. This is uh, called gradient flow. It's just a differential equation that goes down the gradient. And it's widely studied in mathematics to this day. It's amazing how much there is still study about this equation. Um, all right, so what about, um, that's a differential equation that if you discretize it with Euler discretization, you get gradient descent. So, and moreover, you can prove a rate for this. The rate is one over t, where t is the time. So it matches the one over k that you got from discrete. So very nice matching and parallel theories and so on. What about Nesterov's equation? which has the faster rate. Uh, well, uh, this nice paper by Sue Boyd and Candace at Stanford uh, in 2014 took the uh, step size in N Nesterov's method to zero and outpopped this differential equation. So it's second order, it's got a funny three there, and it's non-homogeneous, damping, uh, and somehow this is an equation that comes out of that analysis. Uh, so what can you do with this equation? Well, not a whole lot. You can, you can simulate it. You can sort of do a little bit of analysis with it with Bessel functions. Um, but we looked at this and felt, okay, this is really helpful because we can ask where did that differential equation come from? So just in the same way that Lagrange asked when he looked at F equals MA, where does that come from? Um, you can look at this equation and say, is there an underlying energy principle of some kind that delivers that differential equation? And then hopefully other differential equations. Okay, so that's what we've been doing. Um, and I'm going to now, in the next slide, show you the resulting object. So I'm going to show you an energy expression that delivers differential equations that deliver, in fact, all known acceleration algorithms. And then I'll show you some properties of this thing. So here it is at the very top here. Um, it, has a, it looks kind of complicated, but it's got really two main pieces. This object right here is called a Bregman divergence. On the next slide, I'm going to give you a picture for that. And this is the function f you're trying to go downhill on. So I'm going to be calling this a kinetic energy, and I'm going to be calling this a potential energy. All these other alphas, gamma, and betas are just scaling of time that gives you a family of algorithms and not just one algorithm. There's, there are the degrees of freedom in the problem, okay? All right, so let me show you this Bregman divergence. Here it is again, right here. All right, a Bregman divergence is a, is a general way of measuring distance. If I want to measure distance between a, x and y in some space, some arbitrary space, I can put an, arbit, uh, an auxiliary function h of, above the space, all right, and now I can take the discrepancy between h um, uh, at x, uh, sorry, the, the linear uh, ex extrapolation um, uh, of um, at y based on a linear extrapolation at x, that line, and the difference between that and h of y. So this is right, I've written in math right here. Uh, so that red distance right there uh, in the vertical direction measures the distance between x and y in the horizontal direction. If h is just a quadratic, this is just a fancy way, it's a variational way of talking about Euclidean distance. But if H is, say, logarithmic, you get the kolbach liebler divergence and a whole bunch of other interesting distance measures come out of this formalism. So it's widely used in, uh, in optimization. 
So we've used it in a, in a novel way, which is that we're taking the Bregman divergence based on auxiliary function h uh, between x where you currently are and x plus, this is again just a time scaling, x plus x dot, okay? So we're looking ahead a little bit, and this is some kind of an elastic energy, saying how good is it to move in the direction of your current velocity, okay? So that's that Bregman divergence. So if h uh, is quadratic, we get Euclidean distance, this thing, that first term, just reduces to one-half x dot squared, where x dot is the, is the velocity. This, if you took any physics, all you'll know is the kinetic energy, right? And then we're subtracting this object right here. This better be a, we can call that a potential energy. So this is a real old-fashioned Lagrangian. It's time-varying, but otherwise it's a good old-fashioned Lagrangian. Okay, so what, this is an energy as a function of your path. So what does Lagrange tell us to do with energy functions? So to go back to this slide here now, Lagrange said, took, take that object, that energy, put it inside of an integral, that gives you just a number, and then optimize over all paths. So you might find a particular path optimizes that. And in physics, this would be the path that some particle would follow. But for us, it's just the path which is the best path for optimization purposes. And then now what mathematics do you do? Uh, again, if you're not used to this, don't worry. I hope you're getting the picture even without the math. But it's not that hard. You write down, you set all partial derivatives of this thing to zero effectively. In continuous time, that's, those are called the Euler-Lagrange equations. Um, and I guess Euler and Lagrange were both not too far away from here. Euler was, of course, Swiss. And Lagrange, unbelievably, was Italian, even though despite the uh, Lagrange, the French-sounding name. Um, so you take a bunch of partial derivatives of this thing up here and then a time derivative. It's not hard. You can do it in three lines. You take this object and it turns into this master differential equation down here. So even though it looks complicated, this is it. All known acceleration methods are, are embodied there. Uh, and it's really, in some sense, simple. It's just second order. There's just a little simple damping term here. And this is just a bunch of geometry, depending on your choice of h. OK? All right. So having gotten that kind of equation, what do you do with it? Well, you try to analyze it a bit. Um, so one of the things you want out of all these algorithms is their rate of convergence. Uh, so that long list of accelerated methods I told you about earlier, they all have known rates, but they're all a very special case analysis. It's two or three pages of inequalities and, and, and so on, and eventually you get out a rate. Um, I'm going to show you that you can get out one rate for this entire uh, sequence of equations in, uh, in continuous time with one line proof. So here's the proof. First of all, the rate is uh, exponential in minus beta t, where that's one of those degrees of freedom which you can set. Okay? So that's kind of already interesting. It sort of suggests you can set your own rate, which sounds strange. How can you set your own rate? You can go as fast as you want, and so we'll return that to in a minute. All right, and what's the proof? Uh, the proof is to uh, write down what's called a Lyapunov function. Here it is. It's just, again, a Bregman divergence of some kind and some time-varying stuff. Lyapunov functions are objects where if you take their first derivative, they need to be negative for you to be going downhill on this certificate, if you will. And this is negative if and only if this rate is achieved. So that's a very simple, elegant proof. It kind of gave us uh, confidence that we were on the right path here. We had gotten the right kind of mathematical objects to be manipulated to make everything turn out to be really simple instead of so complicated. OK, so now, what about this, this, this rate? OK, first of all, it seems like you can get whatever rate you want. And secondly, it's exponentially fast. We don't expect that in real life. We expect rates like 1 over t, 1 over t squared, like the gradient methods. All right, so what's happening here? All right, so this is, what I th this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to sort of skip some slides and say this in English. I think it'll be a little easier. Um, so um, let's imagine we're trying to solve some problem, say a convex optimization problem, and um, I pick some rate I want to achieve. I set beta of t equal to uh, the logarithm of 1 over t. When the exponential will kill the logarithm, I'll get 1 over t. Okay? And I solve the problem with all the math I just showed you. Then I will follow some path, and I will follow it at the speed 1 over t. Now, let's suppose Tom is a little more ambitious person. He says, no, I want to go at rate 1 over t squared. So I'm going to put that into the math and see what happens. So when he puts it in the math, a very interesting thing happens. He will follow the exact same path as I follow. All right? And the mathematical reason is that this operator, this Lagrangian, is covariant. So it will deliver the same path for whatever choice of beta. All that will happen is he'll follow that same path. He'll just go faster along it. And all that happens is he's using a different clock than mine. All right? So it's just like Einstein. You can use different clocks, and it doesn't really matter. In both cases, we're going on the same path. He just has a different definition of time, so he thinks he's going faster. All right? Now, someone else in the audience might say, well, I can go even faster. I'm going to use an exponentially fast clock. All right? You put that into the math, it'll again deliver the same path, and, but you will move along it really fast, zooming along it. 
All right, so that says two things. First of all, in continuous time, there is an optimal way to optimize. All right, that's a new concept. Optimization hasn't really thought about optimal way to optimize. And that optimal way to optimize is characterized by this Lagrangian, and it gives you a certain path. Right? But you still have a degree of freedom of how much speed to use along that path. And there, you're just totally free in continuous time. You do whatever you want. So in that sense, that part of acceleration is not interesting. All right. Now, the last part of the story, then, is the most interesting of all, which is this all, has all been done in continuous time. And it turned out to be kind of interesting, but not entirely. But now we need to put this back on the computer. So we have to discretize these differential equations. And we know we can't get exponential rates in discrete time. We have oracle lower bounds, and we have centuries of practice that tell us we can't do that. So this ambitious person who was doing exponentially fast in continuous time, what happened? Why, or why could he or she not go back and get an algorithm in discrete time, whereas Tom and I can with our less ambitious rate? All right, so, all, so let me just state what happens at this point. Uh, what happens is that the entire problem of taking differential equations and discretizing them raises its head. And um, I, at least, didn't have enough education to know that that's not just a little small area of numerical analysis with, you know, runga cut algorithms or Euler methods, that that's a very rich tradition of methods, going back to Hamilton, Jacobi, Poincaré, and others, uh, where very interesting integrators were discovered called symplectic integrators. All right, so how many of you in the audience already know what a symplectic integrator is, just to get a little bit of a feel? Yeah, only a couple. Um, it's kind of amazing because these big names discovered in the 1800s and just polished it off, and every math department now has several symplectic geometers in it. It's a whole big area of math. But they're so separated off from the rest of us that somehow that no one knows about it. All right, so in the last little bit here, I'm going to try to tell you how symplectic integrators relate to this problem. And again, I think I'll skip some slides. I'm going to skip, I've said all this in English, so I'm just going to kind of skip. Let me just say that when you make some particular assumptions about alpha, beta, and gamma, then that master differential equation simplifies, and if you keep simplifying, turn H into Euclidean all, you get back to this equation that we started with. Okay, so I just, I hope, reassures you that, in fact, that master equation could deliver um, the, the known uh, accelerated algorithms. And this is the proof that, uh, that this thing is covariant, so I'm going to skip this as well. It's, but I hope you appreciate these are like one-line proofs. Um, now, if you take uh, the differential equation, that these things deliver, and you try to discretize them using runga kata or Euler method or the standard things you would use, um, it, they don't work. So you go in towards an optimum, and then it's, it's unstable. It shoots off to infinity. And here you can see it in one dimension. All right? Um, so for a while, we had no idea how to discretize any of these differential equations. We finally found a kind of ad hoc methodology for discretizing them uh, that we were able to prove something about. But it was unsatisfying. All right, and so there were some mysteries about a year ago. Um, why can't we discretize dynamics when we're using these, these overly ambitious fast clocks in continuous time? What happens when we arrive at a clock speed that we can discretize? How do we discretize once it's actually possible? All right, and I claim that all of these mysteries can be solved by thinking about, by knowing about symplectic integration. All right, um, so this is an amazing topic. Uh, Hamilton um, and so on studied this in the 1800s, and what were they doing? Well, they were taking the physics equations, like Newton's equations, and they were thinking about how to discretize them. And that's kind of amazing because there was no computers yet. So I actually don't know the history of why they were doing this. Um, but they've asked the following really interesting question. Suppose I take a differential equation that has a continuous curve that results. Um, and now I think about now discretizing it. I'm going to now hop along in, in discrete time. All right. Now, uh, in physical equations, if you solve the exact equation, they don't just flow in some way, they also conserve various quantities. So for example, momentum might be conserved, or energy, or in general what are called volumes and phase space. Um, so those are exactly conserved along the true flow. So now if you were doing an approximation on a computer, you're going to hop along approximately, that's OK. But it could be that you're losing energy and momentum as you go. And that's not OK. You're really doing the wrong physics. So if you're simulating the explosions of the cosmos and you're losing energy at every step, somehow that's just not good. It's not good physics. So anyway, Hamilton, Jacobi, and others thought about this problem, and they solved it exactly. They were able to find ways to integrate approximately such that you exactly conserved volumes of phase space, like momentum and energy. Okay? And it's called symplectic integration. It, roughly speaking, has the flavor of do, uh, both implicit and explicit integration, if you know what that means, and interlace them in a certain way. All right. So, um, that exists as a field. There's a bunch of beautiful books, which I've been reading over the last year about this. And um, 
I'm going to show now, uh, well, I'm going to show a picture of doing this. I want to end here in a couple of minutes, uh, just in case any of you are concerned. I don't even check in, checking the time. Yeah, I'm the lower. Um, so the way you do this is you don't use just Lagrangian mechanics, you use Hamiltonian mechanics. There's a simple thing called a Legendre transform that takes you from one to the other. And now you're in the Hamiltonian space, there's a recipe for how to get a symplectic integrator. All right, so we took everything I've said so far, and here's maybe the bet I'll kind of be ending here. Um, we uh, took this whole framework and we generated a Lagrangian that gave us a Hamiltonian, that gave us a symplectic integrator, and we just did it on the computer. And here it is, and this is actually in a high dimensional space, but we're projecting it. Uh, you can see it oscillates, it does go down, then it goes back up. Uh, and that rate it's achieved here is in fact the, exactly the known oracle rate. This is the, it's achieving the lower bound, and it's doing it provably, and it's doing it from a simple mathematical framework. Um, all right, so the last little mystery here, which is unsolved, which is open, and I encourage anyone who's interested in these things to help think about it, which is that if you do this with Nesterov's algorithm, it also comes down and achieves the oracle rate, as it must, uh, but near the end, it does better than this approach. And so what's kind of happening is the physics perspective uh, says use momentum to get down the hill as fast as you can, but when you're at the bottom, you really need to shut off the momentum faster than the physics allows you to, so you can converge into the answer, and gradient descent allows you to do that. So Nestrov, in some magical way, is combining those two things. If we just add the two together, we take gradient flow and add it to uh, the Hamiltonian that we, I, I just showed you, our mix achieves the oracle rate and then it goes faster near the bottom. But that's heuristic. There's no reason, we had no, no reason to do that other than it, it matches Nesterov. Um, it's actually three times faster than Nesterov because Nesterov uses two gradients per iteration. This uses only one. So this, in some sense, is, one of the, is the state of the art right now for gradient-based uh, optimization of convex functions. Okay, so I'm going to finish now. Um, I hope the big picture is clear here that maybe you came to see robots moving and see artificial intelligence solving all the world's problems. And other people can give you that talk. That's all really interesting. But I really am trying to say the more dour um, we're just at the beginning of this field. We don't have artificial intelligence yet. We have some mathematical ideas that allow us to learn from data, and we can do that on computers so it can you know, be done at scale and run fast. Um, but we are really missing a lot of the fundamental principles that will make this into an actual discipline that humans will be not just proud of, but which humans will trust, and humans will be willing to start to take over aspects of our, of our world. Um, and so some of these things will happen slowly, uh, where it's not so much that human lives are in danger. Others, you know, like self-driving cars, human lives will be in danger and it'll have to be done much more slowly uh, in concert with other people in society like lawyers and, and so on. Um, but if you're young, and I see many young people in the audience, uh, think of this as a field which is just getting started and don't neglect the math. This is not about just download software and put it out with big data sets and try it out and build a company and make a lot of money. Yes, people are doing that. Uh, but really, if we're going to be serious about this, serious scientists and engineers, uh, we have to realize that we're at the beginning of a field and not at the end, and we have a big responsibility. So thank you. Curious in what sense can you guarantee privacy? So I, if I have a botnet which makes you know ten thousand requests yeah. in your database per second, and I transfer you one box, can I you know? And I, I'm making the request and I'm transferring you one dollar. Can I figure yeah. out how much money you have in the bank? Yeah. So uh, bank is a good metaphor. So differential privacy has a beautiful composition property, which is that if one, on one query you have a, a you have a privacy loss of alpha. When you make two queries, you have a privacy loss of two alpha. And even more interestingly, if I take two unrelated or two databases, related databases, and I have privacy alpha one here and alpha two here, when I put the two together, join them in any way, I have a privacy loss of alpha one plus alpha two. All right, so that's not true of many other privacy mechanisms. As you may know, if you've seen from the newspaper, sometimes if you put together one data set with another data set, you can discover all kinds of things about people. Uh, those data sets were not prepared with differential privacy in mind. If you do it, you get this limited notion of loss. So that's what's beautiful about it, and that's kind of why we kept it alive here. Uh, but it is a very stringent privacy criterion, probably too stringent for real life. And I didn't mention that, but our, our, our formula went from n to n alpha squared divided by d. d is the dimension of the problem, and in high dimensions, that divide by d is, hor is terrible. And that's because it's hard to protect privacy in all directions. 
So there needs to be a new theory that's more inferential that allows you to practicalize it only in some directions while still doing good inference. And that theory is, I mean, I can sort of imagine what it would look like, but it's not available yet. No one's developed it. Let me just say privacy is a fantastic topic. I haven't worked that much on it, but I, I hope to convey how interesting it is. It's, uh, it's certainly a lot of technical ideas can help understand it, but it's definitely not just technical ideas. It's society agreeing on how to, uh, what level of privacy to achieve and how to achieve it and what, you know. Also, uh, I said earlier, if I say to Tom, uh, can I have your genome? And he says alpha equals 0.5. I could also at that moment say, what if I give you a million dollars? Uh, and he might say, well, my alpha in that case is 0.05. <laughs> um, um, well, Tom's a president, he doesn't need the money, but I, if I ask, so <laughs> but no, you get the idea. There should be economic value to these decisions. Uh, you know, risk and, and, and all these, are, uh, these have economic consequences. It's important to pay people when you use something like their data. Uh, so right now the companies are just taking our data, not, not paying us. Uh, and that's wrong. So we have to develop a system that allows a currency, in this case alpha, but we have to develop other currencies that allow us to actually get value out of, uh, out of our own data. So that's still to be done. So you, you said your methods are not monotone, right? Which um, methods are not monotone? The, oh, the descent, they, these are not descent methods. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Uh, but Nesterov has, I mean, ha has methods that are pretty similar to yours and that are yet uh, monotone. They're not. No, Nesterov's acceleration is not monotone. Ah, uh, but but I think he has variants that also. His what? He has uh, methods that are that also like small modifications. Uh, well, the the ba you know, there's a huge number of Nesterov versions of acceleration, right? Well, they have all kinds some, of properties. But himself. this basic one, which is 1983 paper that everyone talks about as Nesterov acceleration, for the simplest possible setting of gradient descent, is not monotone, right? And and that's interesting. I mean, it's like if you're trying to get from here to Vienna as quickly as possible on these curvy roads, you probably don't want to exactly follow the road. You want to do like this, right? And and what's happening is that there is a notion of momentum, and that momentum is giving you oscillations. I don't understand why you're, yeah. you're so concerned about that. Monotone is not necessarily the, what you want. Why should you yeah. ask for monotone? Yeah, right, but I mean... You want the fast rate. Yeah. And if you can achieve some other algorithm that achieves the rate that's monotone, I'm not sure even that's desirable. Yeah, right, but I mean, it's always a nice extra to have, right? No, I don't see it. I mean, it's just a, it's a mathematical imposition you could make on an algorithm, but I want to have a real, real world reason. I have a Lyapunov function in which this thing is monotone. It's not the original objective function. But there's a criterion function, less than or equal to zero, that it's going downhill on. And mathematically, that's totally satisfying to me. And I don't have any reason to ask that on the original function, you're monotone. So think about it a little more and see if you can come up with a, a reason that you should, but I don't see it. All right, thank you. <laughs> How far have companies got at analyzing data? And at what, organizing data? Analyzing data. Analyzing data. Using all of the relevant data that is there. So. Are they just yeah. lying somewhere, or is it processed? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, there are tons of companies analyzing all kinds of data, and, and a lot of them are failing. They're, they're not getting what they thought they would. A lot of them are not doing well on the tail, and they try things out, and the answers aren't good, and they back off. Um, but there are lots of companies that are providing a lot of value to people right now, and so the ones I, I find particularly interesting are the ones who are selling things to people, okay? not just advertisements. People presenting advertisements like Google and Facebook, I don't consider that particularly interesting. Um, but, but Amazon and, and in China, Alibaba, all right, these are places you go and you buy things. And as you probably know, once you buy a few things there, they start to learn about you and they will make recommendations to you. Given you bought these books, here's some other books you might like. And that's, a, that's a interesting, that's a service. Um, and uh, in China particularly, these, these things are going quite fast, far, faster than in the US and faster than in Europe. Um, they are, uh, have like 500 million people on a platform like that, and people are using their service to make the payments. There's no credit cards in China. So they learn about all the payments that people are making. And now they learn how economically uh, trustworthy a certain person is, and they can make loans to that person. And they do. So there's a whole now new banking system done by these companies uh, for everybody in China, not just for the rich people, which it had been in the past. So now they can recommend all kinds of things to people. They can say, you might like this restaurant now that you're visiting this city based on the kind of things you like back in your old city. The restaurant person can look at this and say, oh, he's visiting my city and he likes my kind of food. I'm going to make him, on his cell phone, a 10% discount offer for 10 minutes. And if he accepts, then he fills a seat in my restaurant. And I keep doing that until my restaurant's full, 
and then other restaurants could be full. So you can create a whole economy of offers and accepts and then filling places and not, not just restaurants, but all kinds of other human services. Um, so I also think about music as a domain I'm very interested in, um, a musician, and um, uh, it is a fact that right now more music is being made than ever in human history, because on our laptops we can make music pretty good, and more people are listening to it than ever in history, but none of the musicians are getting paid for it. And so most of the musicians are, except the small, you know, picked subset, are working as taxi drivers or, or waiters, and then at night making some music. So that's wrong. That's just, that's wrong. That's not good for human society. So how do you fix that? Uh, well, you don't just have a government come in and every, tell everybody they have to do You create a market. So you create a market by learning for each musician where their fans are by watching the data of seeing, well, you know, that particular musician is being loved up, you know, in um, Hamburg. And so the musician gets to learn this, and the musician says, well, if I go to Hamburg and do a concert, a lot of people come, I'll make some money, maybe 25,000 euros. And that's, if I do that three times a year, that's enough to have a job, that's my job, all right? So you've now created an economy between consumers and producers, um, like in the restaurant case, also the music case, and so on. So I think of those as the most interesting to me, in technology uses of data, is, is making new services and new markets between humans and consumers and producers. And of course, all, there's all the science side. If, you know, I do think that me personalized medicine is fascinating and interesting. It will change medicine. It'll allow you to get a targeted uh, treatment instead of just a cocktail of drugs. Um, and uh, those are probably the two that I find the most interesting. But, um, and in some sense, these have nothing to do with AI. That's, that's also what's kind of interesting. They're just about systems that work and provide services to people. Um, in AI, per se, I think that natural language processing is particularly interesting in systems that have dialogues. But um, let me stop that answer that long question. All right.